All right, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I want to make sure this is working. I should have done that before I said hi. So first off, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, it's a really exciting event, um, and especially celebrating Black History Month. It has a special, you know, just place in our hearts here at Atlas. We're a few blocks away from Black Wall Street and from the historic Greenwood District. And to be here with three, you know, entrepreneurs at the forefront of innovation and black excellence here in Tulsa is a really exciting thing. So thank you to all of you for being here. Um, black Wall Street, it signified for entrepreneurs at the time, you know, that black entrepreneurs are not only able to exist, but they're able to thrive and, you know, really be at the forefront of whatever industry they're in. So being a part of this conversation and, you know, just participating in this discussion is helping honor that legacy that they had and helping pave the way for a future where black business owners and entrepreneurs in Tulsa and anywhere can experience the opportunities and success that the ones on the stage here today are. Um, so with that, we'll um, get started. We'll just go down, introduce everyone, talk a little bit about their organizations. Um, and then from there, we'll get into three different topics. So we have navigating career paths, um, challenges and opportunities, and then the final one, building networks and communities. Um, we're going to try to ask at least two questions to everyone for this, but I don't want to keep anyone too long past seven. So we'll adjust based off of the timing there. So if it'll go, okay, so we'll start with me. Um, my name is Anthony Ash. I'm a staff member here at Atlas School. I've been working here since January of last year, and I moved to Tulsa through the Tulsa Remote Program in the summer of 2022. Um, so I'll pass it off to Michael. All right. <laughs> my name is Michael Vaughn. I am the founder and executive director of Urban Coders Guild. We are a Tulsa-based nonprofit that exists to provide computer science education for the underserved, underrepresented, and otherwise under-resourced youth of Tulsa. I'll go next. Uh, oh. <laughs> since we switched places and all. <laughs> all right, well, my name is Jamar Torres. I originally moved here in November 2021 for Tulsa Remote. And uh, more recently, I started working at Atento Capital, which is an investment firm here in Tulsa. Uh, I work as a program manager, and really that's helped me helping to build opportunities and experiences for current students and early, uh, early career applicants. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's move on to Dominique. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Dominic Artis, founder and CEO of Act House. Um, we have a, a pretty awesome opportunity to help the world uh, have common language around how you design, build, and invest in teams. Um, a lot of us know, uh, a lot of people know about our work, uh, particularly here in Tulsa, within our accelerator and our pre-accelerator. Um, it's just, it's kind of crazy to think that it's almost been three years now. Uh, April 4th, 2021 just felt like yesterday in some respects. Um, but we run a pretty cool accelerator by name of um, Act Tulsa, Act House Accelerator. Uh, we invest $70,000 in black and Latino-led startups at 0% interest, 0% equity. Um, we always say the terms are friendly, but we're not, um, which means like the accelerator is like, it takes you through a lot. Um, but, the, but the terms are some of the best terms you'll probably find on the market. Um, but it's real cool. Like we've been here for a good while. Um, we've had about 10, 12 years within the spaces of startups, incubators, tech, product development. Um, it's real cool. And I get a chance to um, be tolerated by uh, a team of nine. Uh, one, of the, one of those people in the room right now, Maria Kim. Uh, I had to shout her out. It's just life. Um, but nonetheless, though, I'm happy to be here and, and happy to be a part of what Atlas is doing in the community. They've been a huge partner to us um, in how we run our pre-accelerator. Uh, we typically have it here and special, I guess, not, point, what you, what's the statement when you say, like, uh, point of privilege? Is that it? Yeah, March 1st, we're having another pre-accelerator hackathon. I don't, yeah, <laughs> we'll talk more about it. But anyways, and um, another point of privilege, if you can volunteer, I'm, I know I'm calling you out, uh, but Michael's or organization, um, Urban Coders Guild, is having a hackathon here on Saturday. 
um, all for the youth, which is about to be amazing. And I'm volunteering. So if you guys want to come, come on out. Absolutely. All right, so getting started. First question, um, Dominic finished off talking about Atlas School, and I want our first question to start there as well. Um, most of our students um, are career starters in the software engineering or technology industries. They don't have a lot of experience there specifically or have had experience in another industry. Um, that's a unique challenge for them and something that we you know, really work to help them overcome. Um, in y'all's collective experience, what would you, what advice would you provide to a career starter? Um, it could be in technology or just in general. Um, what advice would you provide in terms of opportunities to seek out um, and also resources that might be at their disposal? Whoever, whoever wants to. <laughs> so I, I think I have a, an interesting story. I spent 10 years living in Japan. Some of you all I know. Um, and you know the story well that I spent 10 years living in Japan, had a really, really successful career in tech. But what I didn't have was a sense of purpose. And for me, some folks have a midlife crisis and they, you know, dye their hair and go buy a Ferrari or something like that. But for me, it was finding a sense of purpose. And when I think about folks finding their calling, it really is that thing that you can not not do and it is stepping out on faith. Um, it is doing something that is different, something that you might even be a little bit afraid of, something that requires a very, very courage. And that might look like taking your first coding class. That might look like you waking up and walking into your office and quitting your job. I don't know what that's gonna look like for you, but just knowing that, just knowing that you need to be open to it, you should be open to it. I like that. I would say for me, I'm someone who has made many career pivots. I first studied international relations and worked at the United Nations. Uh, I started off in a research role. I did uh, an administrative role. I'd done a sort of junior political role. And I think for me, I wanted more sense of a purpose, like that, there goes that purpose word. And I think for me, um, how I can relate to this question is, I think is you have to be very intentional with what you're seeking and what, from the attention, that's from there you go on to uh, build a relationships and really network in, but network in intentionally because you can't just go up to someone and have a conversation and expect to get a job at the end of it. I think uh, one thing that's worked for me is just being really intentional and really seeking out the individuals I want to connect with, but also doing it in a genuine way. I think people at the end of the day want to talk to people they actually want real conversations with. Uh, like for instance, I wouldn't just go up to Dom and say like, hey, I read all about you. I think you're amazing, X, Y, and Z. And Thank you. <laughs> but like, I mean, like you could start with that, but then you need to also to segue a natural conversation and really just build a connection because I'm sure uh, like other folks in this room, you meet different people every single day of the year. And I think it's really important to be intentional. And that's what I'll say. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I like that. Uh, the intentionality and purpose, I think, is extremely key. I think it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter what stage you're at. Those things are still going to like be continuums throughout, right? Whether you're 28 to 21 to 28, 28 to 35, 35 to 42, 42 to 49, like whatever it may be. Um, I think if you if you can like identify purpose like as fast as you can, which is challenging, um, and then be intentional in that, your career will take different looks like my first career was in uh, politics public policy speech writing was an aide to the mayor aide to the city commissioner um, did a lot of lobbying work a lot of people don't know about my first career um, not because it was like uh, like bad or anything it's just that I don't publicize it or anything like that but you know that there was a lot of core things that I learned through that first journey and some of that was hey I love being at the foreground of this intersection of like purpose and profit, right? Um, I love being at the intersection of like community and um, capitalism in some ways, but not like on the evil side. But like, <laughs> so it's like, how can you, so for my life, it's like, okay, how can I blend these two elements, right? And, and mainly because I think what I found when I was more in the political scene and like the social uh, work scene, there was a lot of great ideas, innovation, um, impact that was happening in these spaces, but not necessarily infrastructure or models to keep them continuously funded. So you'll see one or two things get off the ground, then it dies, right? And so 
the question is, okay, how do you like obtain profit in order to continue to fund the purpose? And so I think Act House is a world where I think we've kind of nailed that in some respects. Um, but it, it took some years and just kind of tinkering around and, and having some fun. And I think also too, you have to, to cut your teeth and be aware of what are my talents and skills and then understand where you can begin to deploy those because you may not find purpose immediately, um, but it's by drumming on something in particular, right? Like Michael was talking about like a great career in tech, you know, overseas. Um, he knew tech was a passion, but the purpose was like, okay, how is this getting back into the generations that are coming after? And so um, a purpose to me is not something that just has to feel um, like in this do-gooder sense, um, but it's just, there's a certain sense of direction that you just have when you have it. Yeah. Um, speaking towards that and just piggybacking off of that, um, you know, all of y'all, you know, at this point in your careers, you know, are, you know, have found that purpose and you know obviously it's a continuous process you're still gonna searching continue bro. to find that um, but at this point um, and you know being where you guys are right now is there any you know experiences resource resources mentors um, or you know any collection of those things that you feel like has helped you get to the point you're at right now and has you know established your purpose within your your current world roles yeah I can drop a couple um, a couple of books I think that were transformative for me. One was How to Get Your Point Across in 30 Seconds or Less. Uh, I was wrong about who read that? Who said that? Okay. Um, okay, cool, cool, cool. So it was written by this, this kind of entertainment attorney by the name of Milo Frank. And it's literally like showing you a path of how to be intentional um, and also to like achieve the vision, which I thought was pretty transformative. Um, the Richest Man Who Ever Lived, King Solomon's Secrets to Success, Wealth, and Happiness. Um, that one taught me a lot about just the full spectrum of, um, you know, it's, there, there's, there's more to life than just this work thing, right? And oftentimes when we think wealth, we think money. Um, but wealth is like a lot of different things, right? Like it's, it's our health, our mental, how we begin to flow and operate. Um, and then I think it's, you have to have a collective community that you can just begin to to sharpen things, and sometimes you have to recruit community. Like, all your friends just don't happen by happenstance, right? Like, um, sometimes you have to be intentional in that regard to actually like recruit the type of people you want in your life. Um, and so some of those things have been helpful, but um, to, because I said how to get your point across in 30 seconds or less, I'm working on not saying anything else, so <laughs> pass it out to y'all. Uh, I would say I definitely need to work on, my, on that. I probably need to read that book because uh, Anyway, getting back to the point I want to make. <laughs> I think what really helped me make my, found my calling. So at one point, what I meant to finish saying was uh, eventually I moved myself into tech and I completed a, a, boot, like a code and boot camp program very similar to uh, Outlaw School where uh, I was immersed in it uh, pretty intensely for over a year. And I think uh, just to tie back to that really quickly, I think what's really important for getting a job in the tech industry is what you bring to the table and projects that you work on and things that show your passion. No one really, I would say some recruiters care and as one myself now, I would say it's not so much the years of experience, it's actually what you've worked on, especially yeah. as a developer. I think people wanna see what can you build, what's your style, what do you, what's your passions, not just saying I have five years of experience and I'm a great code challenge solver. <laughs> I think that's great, it depends on the employer as well. But for me, my calling, I think I found one thing I would say through a, a Tento as a program manager is I really enjoy building uh, opportunities for people and I think helping to connect uh, young people with opportunities and bring them to, from uh, an intern level to full-time employment I think is just great because I really like seeing people who are considered unsunk potential so sort of using the vision of uh, Atento into how I recruit I look for people who really bring things to like bring passion I would say for sure um, I think for me in particular I think like experiences that helped uh, me get here also is because I realized I hated being a developer. It was not my favorite thing. I know we have developers in the room, but I think being honest with yourself is important. And I think for me, I love working with tech. I love tech. I like working with developers. I just don't want to be one. So I think being honest with yourself will help bring you to the path that you really truly belong in. For me, I started my tech career in a time when most developers worked pretty much solo 
and it was very isolating. I am very much though a community oriented, family oriented kind of person. Um, that's one of the reasons why I started Urban Coders Guild was because of my, my love for my community. When I think about any advice or an experience that I would want you all to take away from this conversation is the, the idea of community. Tulsa is a pretty small town. Um, at this point, most of us are only one or two degrees of separation from one another. And when you think about your career, starting your careers, you're, you know, for the folks that are at Atlas School, you know, you're in a cohort or you're in a community, but being able to leverage that community to not just in a transactional way, but being able to leverage that community, want to help you grow as a person, but also to help you grow professionally as well. Ash, can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. I think one thing that was also helpful too, I think in navigating some of these career things was that um, I did, there was one thing that I did that was very, like extremely helpful and it was kind of like sketching out my subconscious. I think oftentimes we, and you know it, like especially if you, if you find yourself in the wrong spot, um, like you're working on something, but you're subconsciously, you're subconsciously thinking about something else, whether it be an idea or a space that you want to be in. And oftentimes as you navigate and go through life, you may have, people in your life that either like speak negatively on the ideas or the projects or whatever you're working on. And so those things kind of get pushed on the back shelf. But I think the more you can begin to sketch your subconscious and bring those things to illumination, like it's on paper now, like you gotta see it, it gives you some type of like, um, like wayfinder in some ways. If you continue to like unveil it and unpack it um, in a way where you can kind of find the, the path that you need to move on and you know, purpose, I, I don't think is this thing that's like, you, you grab it once and then that's it, right? But it's, it's this infinite unfolding that takes place. Um, and so you have to have that patience with yourself as you move forward in it too. So, yeah. All right. Um, and then last thing on this category, all of you guys are, you know, working with, help, helping mentor, you know, helping provide guidance to people who are in one way or another entering into the entrepreneurial space or into the tech space, maybe a bit younger for Michael. Um, what are some common misconceptions or, you know, maybe just hurdles that people face internally or externally when they're trying to, you know, get themselves into that, you know, startup space, that tech space, or, you know, trying to motivate themselves or prove to themselves that they belong there? Um, I think the last part of what you said, like thinking that they don't belong. You know, oftentimes when you think about tech, you mainly think about software engineers and developers. But golly, it's so, there's so much more breadth to what's happening. Like, I ended up in the space, my uh, graduate degree, I did a joint <coughs> master's in urban planning and international affairs. And it was because I fell in love with citizen engagement and like learned all the methodologies and tools of that world, which is social sciences, where I wanted to be in tech, but I wasn't an engineer. I wasn't a designer. And I remember like all my friends in, in urban planning were like um, focused on economic development or transportation planning, but I was interested in the urban planning of technology. So I started to write more about it and you know, a paper would get published or I would present at a conference or two. But I started when I needed to make the transition, I just took stock of like what I have. And you can recognize that a lot of your skills are in some ways transferable. You just have to look at them differently. Oftentimes we're always thinking about like, what's the new thing? But really, if you just breathe on the old thing or like the skills that you have, you'll see a new perspective, like it'll be fresh for you, it, it'll, it'll expand your mind. And so I think in that respects, like that transition for me was good. And you know, this was 2011 or 10, I think it was 2010 or 11. I found myself like sketching out my subconscious, thinking about like, okay, well, what am I, you know? And I was like, I know, I'm architecting something, I know it. Like, I just know I'm working on something. And I remember putting this down on paper, like, oh, I'm a user experience architect, because I was thinking about Steve Jobs and like, what was he doing? And I, I promise y'all, I thought I came up with this term. Now granted, like I was not in the Bay, I was not in Boston, I was like in Florida, um, in Tallahassee, Florida, right? So it's like low key Southern Georgia. But when I, when I typed it in on Google, I was like, oh shoot, there's a lot of freaking jobs in user experience architecture, right? 
And there's a lot of people making a crap ton of money while they're doing it, right? And so I think oftentimes when we hear tech, we just hear engineering, like programming, like those spaces. Um, But there's a lot of transferable skills that a lot of people have. They just have to just see them with a new lens. And I think having conversations with people begin to like broaden your horizon and that, so. Working with young people, I remind them that yes, they're learning to code, but there are so many other areas, and like like you mentioned, um, user experience, user interfaces. Um, some of my young people are amazing writers. They're technical writers. There are project managers. I actually had my best job in in tech as a tech um, as an IT project manager. It's a matter of finding your space. It's a matter of finding a space that you feel like that you can excel in and a space that resonates with who you are and who you want to be. When I think about not just my students, but also people in our community, there is, you mentioned a fear of the unknown, and it is that that keeps us from taking that first step. But really it is a matter of bravery, it is a matter of courageousness, it is an understanding that we are whether we want to or not, we're moving in a more and more um, tech-based world. And Tulsa specifically, we are an emerging tech hub. Our next jobs are going to be more tech. When you think about, I'm 43, and when I think about um, where we've kind of, in, in my lifetime, I know and I talk to my kids about you know, landlines and dial-up and they have no idea what that is. I'm telling you. <laughs> but like this morning when there was an AT&T outage, thinking about come on. Wi-Fi being down, like the world ends. And so we've come, we've come that far in 30 years, and 30 years from now, there are going to be jobs that we have no idea that even exist, or that right now that don't even, we can't even fathom. But giving our young folks one that, that courage to try something new, knowing that there are multiple spaces, multiple entry points, and really beyond just coding and beyond tech, encouraging a certain sense of comfort, a certain sense of confidence, a certain sense of community, and helping them to build their critical thinking skills, their communication skills, their collaboration skills, all those skills that transcend wherever they land in tech or non-tech. I think to add to that, I think what really is important is, I agree, like really, finding what your niche uh, sort of focus would be within tech because I originally was a web developer thinking that that was my entryway into tech and quickly realizing that it wasn't for me. I think what really helped me is I explored product management and that came to me much more naturally and I really enjoyed it. And I think uh, it's really helped to just take a chance, like take a chance on what you want to pursue. If you think you want to be a product manager or if you want to be a back-end web developer or uh, any other career in tech, I think it's just going for it. I think a lot of people self-sabotage and undersell themselves, and I think that comes from things like seeing job descriptions, seeing an opportunity that says five years experience when you have two. I would still apply. I think like thinking about the job market, you really need to just go for things and really not be your own worst enemy, because I think a lot of people, and I've done this myself to be honest, I'll see uh, deliverables for a job description and say, oh, I have this much experience, I don't have that, therefore I won't apply that's when you, you're, you're, you yourself are your own hurdle. Because the worst thing that could happen is you just don't hear back. Uh, so I think you just really have to go for it and really uh, dedicate yourself to it, um, for sure. People oversell themselves too, but that's another conversation. <laughs> True. <laughs> Overselling or imposter syndrome. And I think with tech, imposter syndrome is so common, but I think that happens to all of us. I think it goes back to something you said though, as far as like, don't come in and shout that you have five years experience, show me what you've done in five years, right? And that that goes to like, even the simple notion of, hey now, let me actually take pride in what I'm doing right now, like being present in that building right now, because when you're done with it, you now have a story to tell, right? And so, I always think about like, hey, what are the artifacts that give me access, right? When I'm, when I'm done with something, when I've completed something, how does that artifact that's now been created speak 
and how does it grant me access in the next journey or the next level that I want to be in? But it, it takes that. Like, when I got five years of experience, that's great. What did you do in those five years? <laughs> Let me switch. There we go. So thank you all for answers to that first section. We're going to move on to challenges and opportunities now. Um, so first question here, um, you know, we're talking about just the, I, I really liked what you said, Mike Kelly, just about the, there's so many opportunities that we can't even fathom yet that, you know, we aren't aware of. And as they emerge, you know, we're going to have to address how we handle those, you know, as a community and, you know, on an individual level, applying to those and, you know, making those realistic opportunities. Um, how can we help bridge the gap between that tech education and then on y'all side of things, the empowerment for entrepreneurs or programmers? How can we help bridge that gap between them and real world career opportunities, particular for, particularly for minorities? For me, it starts with education. And it is, no disrespect to any of our older folks in the room, but it's easier to start something, to start learning something when you're younger, just, just the way our brains are. Um, also, our young folks are very much a, a blank slate, a, a, empty blank canvas really so being able to work with young people one is is a tremendous opportunity to see that moment when they have coded their first couple of lines they hit the simulator um, the simulate button and that project works you can sort of see that light bulb go off over their head you can sort of see the gleam in their eyes but it really is that education um, not just how to code but also seeing yourself as someone who is capable, like being able to, um, to establish identity around being a learner or being someone who can try or someone who could succeed and being able to take that first step. I think to add to that, I think also learning from your failures within your education experience. Uh, failure is something that happens to every single one of us. There's not a single person in here who hasn't failed at something, but failed facilitates growth. It facilitates uh, an experience to help make you a stronger you, whether that is learning to code or changing careers or whether, or just trying something out for the first time. Uh, I think like the repetition and keep going at it I, and the dedication will help build you to be a stronger person in whatever it is, it is that you do. And I do think that kind of that, senti that sentiment of avoiding or fear of failure is I think one thing that can hold people back. But I think within, I would say like minority communities, um, I think like from my own experience, I think it took a lot of learning around this to really confidently keep going at it and not focus on the negative things, but focus on the things that maybe were a setback that helped build me to be a stronger me, whether that is in a personal aspect or a career aspect, because it all does play hand in hand for sure. Uh, to add exposure, and I think it works hand in hand with education. Look, I, I don't think I'm, I'm who I am without my, uh, Dad making one decision, and my mom, but particularly my father, <clears throat> which was, my dad was drafted into the Vietnam War. He took out his draft status and then enlisted. What he didn't know was like how that would open up a world for his sons um, and his wife to like see the world. And I think when you can see what other cultures are doing, what other people are doing, man, it just, it exposes you to so much, right? Um, and so to then like have exposure from zero to six or zero to seven, or actually zero to eight, and then come back to the States and then like be in an environment where it's like, yo, what the hell is this, right? Like you go from like these two polaring worlds and it's like, all right, well, now like, you know, we, we growing up in, in the gritty, right? Like we gotta get after it. You know, you, you gotta think different, but there was always this moment of, um, there was always a sense of wonder because there was exposure. And I think, you know, my nephew who's came out to live with me for like a summer or whatever, but um, I had him intern here that at that time it was Hoberton, but Atlas. And he was already like, uh, like coding and stuff because my older brother got him into it. But for him to see what was happening 
in so many different areas, right? It creates the exposure. And I think oftentimes, even as adults, we forget that we need to still be um, as like um, lost as kids are, right? To like stay wondering, um, take a different route to work. You may never know what you'll find. Um, get out of the bubble of downtown Tulsa, like go out to Broken Arrow, Bixby, like there's a lot of just cooler things, you know, once you just start traveling out. Um, and I think there's just that, you have to have that sense of wonderlust and exposure. And I think it, it keeps you sharp. It exposes you for the most part. Yeah, um, I guess kind of touching on that um, and maybe one of the things that can result from a lack of exposure um, and that you guys mentioned earlier was imposter syndrome. You know, I think that, you know, particularly for minorities in any industry, that's like a real buzzword. We're all, you know, encountering that in some facet and trying to overcome that. Um, how have you all, you know, encountered imposter syndrome and, you know, how have you not only worked through that personally, but how have you helped, you know, assist those around you and those who your organizations you're touching? How have you helped push them through that imposter syndrome as well? I spent a good portion of my career being the only person who looked like me um, in my entire company. Um, living in Japan, that's just kind of a reality. And I also have really, really high anxiety, let's like just be honest, really, really high anxiety. And so that feeling of just being um, inadequate, but also feeling unsupported. And I, when I think about imposter syndrome, I think about something that someone told me recently. It's not a matter of us feeling, feeling inadequate or even being inadequate. There's a question around the supports that we have. And so I always, when you mentioned like imposter syndrome, I'm like, yeah, it's one thing to, to feel like you're not good enough. As a person who is a lifetime, lifetime learner, I'm always gonna feel like there's something else I need to be learning, there's something else I need to be doing. And I feel like that's natural, but being supported in that is different than actually feeling like I'm not good enough because it might be a question of, are you in a space where you are valued, where your voice is heard, yeah, that's that's um that's that's drastically important. Like you have to be in environments where that fostering happens. I think also too, you also have a you have to have a self uh, a sense of identity outside of your culture. And I and I mean that from a standpoint of like, like for me, like my belief in God helps me with a lot, right? In the respects of um, coming into an understanding of like who I am, right? Um, and so. Oftentimes when I found myself in the cultural context of like society, where the overwhelming narrative is this, um, uh, I, I don't know, low vibrational energy tones, like whatever, however you want to say it. Um, you're just like, nah, I, I, don't think, I don't think I believe that about me. And nor do I, like, I don't think God believes that about me. And I think like that's helped me a lot. Um, it doesn't deny facts, right? Like, but it, it helps you have a sense of elevation in your mind to navigate them when they're present, right? Like, you can't deny the fact that 2% of the founders that are black and Latino receive, uh, or, yeah, 2% of the founders that receive investment capital, um, like, within our nation are black and Latino compared to the rest, right? Like, you can't deny that fact. Um, but that fact doesn't make me less than, right? It doesn't make me... Um, you know, uneventful, unsuccessful, like it doesn't make me any of that, right? Um, but I can be aware of the facts which would then help me navigate the market, right? And so I think it's, it's being able to kind of, hey, be grounded in the reality, but also be grounded in this greater reality that I live in um, and know how to navigate in between the two. I think uh, adding to that point, navigated between the two, I think it's very important to really take a step back when necessary. Uh, for instance, when it comes to the imposter syndrome side of things, I, as a developer, I definitely experienced that. And there were moments where it felt like I wanted to give up. <laughs> it felt like, what am I doing here? This is not it. And it's one thing to realize you don't like something, but to discount yourself is your, could be your own worst mistake. And I think for me, uh, seeking help or seeking a mentor came a long way. It helped me 
be a better developer at the time, and I think that experience taught me it is okay to ask for help sometimes. <laughs> like it, Seriously. <laughs> but also doing your effective research or doing your due diligence of really trying your best to help yourself before you take that step also is very helpful because the first thing you also shouldn't do is just immediately ask for help the moment you don't know something. <laughs> uh, but I think an experience I'm thinking of that makes me think about how I've come a long way is uh, there is someone who's an intern before I get in trouble with a tent, so at a 10 turn, who, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no yeah, one brand said was here, but like, uh, someone who was a current at 10 turn, like he has been struggling and he, when I say struggling, I think he's had imposter syndrome. He was uh, entering business development sales and he never had that background before. And I use my experience to help relate to him and tell him like, it's okay, like you just, let's help you read some more resources, let's connect you with another person that has experience in business development. And so far that's helping him be more confident and better at his role because now he has developed a sense of self-confidence instead of self-defeat. And I think that's a key element to kind of overcome imposter syndrome. Awesome, and then final question on this section. Um, I you know, really like the, I guess I didn't like it, but it's interesting, the statistic that you mentioned, Dom, that only 2% of founders um, in the United States are black and Latino. Um, you know, obviously there is a side of that that is not on the entrepreneur or, you know, in your case, the student, you know, there are some things that are out of your control, but as a community um, and as individuals, how can we help encourage more collaboration, more exposure, as you were talking about earlier, to um, you know more collaboration and exposure from those diverse tech businesses and talent, um, and the established tech companies, not only in here but you know across the country, who you know we're trying to get people employed. I just say, be the change you want to see. Like all the promises and the commitments that came out in 2020 and 2021, like you know, there's a real reality that. A lot of that has not come to fruition, but a lot of it was given lip service. So it's, you know, you have to just be the change you want to see. If you want to see it, like, directed and changed, just do it. Um, like, put yourself in the driver's seat and not in the beggar's seat and, and just do it. Because it, it's, um, you can find ways to partner, and I think we've done that in some ways, but trust and believe that I'm not thinking that they're going to come up with a solution or the design to help the community that I live in. Like, it, it's just not gonna happen, yeah. I know that was a morbid answer, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's, as an organization, or as an individual in an organization, I think being intentional with how I recruit is important, but in terms of seeing more opportunities that include uh, people who look like me, like people who are black, people who are Latino. Um, I think a part of that is partnerships. Uh, for instance, uh, for my summer program, I run uh, the attendership program. Uh, I, we partner with uh, HBCU VC so that we can guarantee some black uh, HBCU based students to sit in on the investment team so that we are not only invested in unsunk potential, but we're also invested in unsunk potential within our workspace. Uh, so I think building opportunities through partnerships and really supporting each other I think is important. And I think that facilitates long lasting relationships the next generation tomorrow to become leaders. And in that way we build more and more where hopefully that 2% could go up to 10% to 20% to 40%. But I think regardless, I think it's just building that confidence and building that network and building support to bring more of us into the space so that we have people at all different angles. Like we don't want to just have, say, 20 black engineers in a room. We want black founders, black uh, product managers, project managers, executive assistants, everything. I think um, it's just really great. It'd be really great to see people in every aspect or black investors. I think that's another thing. Like the people who are decision makers have the money. Also at 2%. For real, and it's just something that we have to work toward uh, alleviating that gap and whatever way that we can. So having like me sitting between like two founders here who happen to both be black, I think is a powerful thing because that is a sign of like the change that we need within our Tulsa community, but beyond that. 
if I could just add anything, because I really appreciate what both of you said, I think about something that we mentioned earlier, and that was around community, um, and even around the idea of imposter syndrome. I might not know all of the things, but I, and I do know that there are folks in this room and folks in this town that know what I don't know, or they have access to things that I don't have access to. And being um, honest with myself, <clears throat> being honest with myself and my position, but being vulnerable enough to turn to my community and to my tribe and say, hey, I need help with this thing. Can we work on this thing together? Can we form a partnership? Can we collaborate on some things? And I, just again, stressing the community, Tulsa is um, a lot of things, good and bad, but one thing that it is, is um, community focused. And when folks have an idea or have a passion around something and are willing to say, hey, can you help me with this thing? Folks will say, hey, I am here to help you with this thing. I have resources that, can, that, that I can bring to bear in whatever you're working on. And I, can I add one more thing to that piece? Like, be willing to serve before you're willing to partner. I, I, think that, I think that's like extremely helpful because when you're in service, right, like you're just focused on the give and getting to learn like who this group is, who the people are or whatever, right? Um, I think some of the best partnerships, and I, I'll tell one story of it, like one partnership that we, that we did with Tech Equity Collective, um, it was initially led by Google. Um, their, their director, um, we were in a, in a meeting on a Monday, like 1.30, so I get a call from them. I'm in the meeting, so I'm not picking up. Um, and then I have my Apple Watch, and I saw this text come in, hey, I really need to talk to you like now, now. I was like, okay. So I get the, uh, tell the team, hey, let me step out real quick. Call that person back. They say, hey, I need to figure out how to spend $2.6 million in 48 hours. I was like, okay, that's, sounds challenging. Um, I said, you need to figure this out now. They were like, yeah. I said, okay, well, let me clear one meeting real quick and I'll head back to get to a quiet place and we can dive in. So I went back to my apartment and literally for like two hours, it was me asking a question, another question, another question, just a series of questions, right? To understand the art, the science of like their mission, like what they wanted to do, how they wanted to do it. Um, at the end of the call, we, we thought through how to divide up this 2.6 million. Not one time did I say anything about Act House. Like I was talking about other partners over here, other partners over here, just things, right? The next day, the person calls me, almost like in this pissed manner, like, yo, why didn't you tell me about Bill Day? I was just like, you didn't ask that. Like you asked, how can you spend $2.6 million in 48 hours? You didn't ask me to tell you about Act House. But in service of, that led to a quarter of a million dollar partnership that led us to do the pre-accelerated build day in Miami, now we're doing Atlanta and Houston. And when you just operate in service of, you never know what's gonna happen on the back end, right? Um, and I think oftentimes, like, we're so quick to like, um, it's, we're so quick for me to look at Jamar or Jamar to look at me and be like, oh, you need help. <laughs> right, like, wait, <laughs> why? Why do I do, like, tell me why I need some help. I don't, I don't have a problem with help, but like, you know, the more I can actually like ask questions, get to know Jamar, what he's working on, um, and just be in service of, like, it's easier to partner then. You know, you just, it's like the tenets of building that relationship in a, in a unique way, so. It's awesome, loved all of y'all's answers for that. That was great. Um, so we'll finish off. Um, if it'll switch, there we go. So um, last topic is gonna be building networks and communities. Um, we're gonna have individual questions for this. Um, just based off the time, we'll probably just do one question for everyone on this one. Um, so starting off with Dom, um, beyond just the, oh, I'm trying to think like which question would be, I'll do the second one. Um, what, what impact um, can result from establishing mentor, mentee connections um, between experienced professionals um, you know, and aspiring minority entrepreneurs or business people? Oh man, um, this is probably the wrong question for me to be honest with you. Switch if you want uh, to, that's and, and, and only because you said minority entrepreneurs. So I'll say this, right? Um, and I'll just drill this down into stats and I'll be brief. 
$150 billion went out of venture capital in 2021. 2% of that went to black fa uh, founders and Latino founders. 0.9% went to uh, white female founders. 0.001% went to black female founders, right? Black female founders are the, like, on par, if you just look at the census data, right? Um, have started more companies, right? Uh, each year, they outpace every demographic in the United States, right? But 0.001% of the venture capital funding. Right now, every company is in venture backed, right? Um, but it'd be hard pressed for those individuals to actually go to the banking market, which has been historically prejudiced in so many different ways. And now when you think about all that data and information going into machine learning models to actually accelerate decisions on the underwriting side are too crazy. What does that lead to? People being overly mentored and under-resourced. Um, and so that's why I said this question is probably not the best one for me. However, I do think a mentor-mentee relationship is great. Um, uh, I, but I, but I'll, I'll come from a mentee perspective. So like, um, we've tested in our, in our Accelerate, we've tested the mentor-mentee like mentee relationship. Uh, we've done it, we've tested it. It's, it's mediocre at best. It's a failure in my humble opinion. Um, so we're scrapping it, right? And what we've kind of recognized, and I knew this just from like personal relationships from having mentors, the word mentor is just so heavy, it's thick. Right, it's like it's, it's layers to it, and I actually um, I have three mentors. I mean, three mentees in my life, and I have some people that say, "Oh, that's my mentor," and I'm like, mm. like there's a process, right? But I'll, I'll say that I think in the in the person who's the mentee, I think it is best for you to have some clear vision about why you want this person as a mentor. Um, I think it's also important to understand that that mentor is not Superman, God, Superwoman. Um, just keep going on to all the characters, you know, Suring and Black Panther, all that, you know. It, it's, it's highly important to understand that that person is a human, right? Um, additionally, I, I think it's, it's very important to be, to do the homework of being self-aware before you start picking a mentor. And you have to do work. Like you have to sit with yourself, reflect, uh, write a little bit, like it's okay. Like it's just you, right? Um, and so I think the more that a mentee can actually do that, I think they'll be prepared for a mentor. Um, I remember Matt, he can one day, well hopefully you guys will meet him one day, but Matt St. Fleur is like my first mentee. Um, he was one person who said publicly, like, oh yeah, that's my mentor. And I looked at him, I was just like, are we like, did you execute on what I told you to execute on? Which was, hey, write a one page brain dump on your vision for your life. And for me, if you couldn't do that, then I don't need to be your mentor, two sides. One, I don't know your vision for your life, so I don't know how to best serve you or guide you or advise you. And then two, you don't have the discipline or the diligence to actually keep up with my pace. And so, you know, it, it, it works hand in hand. One, am I fit to, to like advise in this vision? Two, is he fit in order to keep up with my pace, right? And so it's, the word's heavy. I, I'm sorry, I didn't probably give you what you want. No, it's fine, it's fine. But hopefully there's some nuggets that was valuable. Yes, yeah. no, that was a great answer, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Jamar now. Um, what advice would you, you gave me feedback on this question earlier today, so I know that this is a good one. Um, what advice um, would you give to black entrepreneurs in Tulsa who are pitching their ideas to investors, um, such as Atento or you know, companies similar to yours as well? Okay, I, I think uh, for this in particular, I would say uh, every first Friday we at Atento have a first Friday where we open it up to the public for people to come to network or just have a good time. But I think if you're an entrepreneur and you really want to pitch an idea, uh, really try to go to those ask anything sessions because that's when you have direct access to our senior investors who honestly, uh, that's the most attention you'll probably get within that space versus 
the first Friday where they're talking to you and 25 other people and they want to get around the room and sometimes they're being intentional with who they want to speak with and they're probably looking for someone that they want to collaborate on an investment with. So I think if you're coming at it from an angle of wanting to pitch an idea, I think like the ask anything sessions are very great and intentional uh, places to do that because that, uh, for instance, the uh, founder, Mike Bosch, uh, he gets very excited by great ideas, but I think that space is where you'll get his undivided attention. And from there, I would say, like, if you're very intentional, I think, uh, piggybacking off what you said, I think you should be very clear and intentional with what you're also trying to pitch. And if you want to grab a coffee or something like that to build a connection, I think you have to come with an agenda but also um, with an open mind, because sometimes these type of meetings might, facilitate, might end up with a sort of thing of saying that this is a venture capital based company, but I think when you hear things like that, you should really leverage how this could be a resource or a connection to segue you to someone else that might be a better resource. Um, so yeah, keeping an open mind I think is key, but then also I, I can't stress enough to ask anything is important and sometimes there's maybe 10 people that show up so I think that's a great time to really have those conversations. Um, I think also for beyond a Tento or whether it's a Tento I think it's really good to keep going like if you have one investor shoot your idea down it doesn't mean it's a bad idea it just might be that person is either not equipped for that idea yeah, like equipped for that idea or maybe they're not the right resource. Um, so I think you have to keep pushing and don't let one denial deny you your opportunity. You have to just keep pushing and going. But also with that being said, do not be overly aggressive and really <laughs> harass these oh uh, founders <laughs> or like people who are these decision makers because I've seen it before where some of the people are, are very, they're trying to 24 hour pitch their idea. Like I go up to Dom, pitch my idea, go up to you, you, and then the whole thing just becomes a broken record of me aggressively trying to pitch an idea. Just try your best to read the room. I know we have different cadences of how we talk, but I think you have to adapt to your audience and really also don't harass them to become like a nuisance to them. You want to build a relationship, not be that person that they're like, oh gosh, this person's coming up to me. Let's just get this conversation over with so I can move on. So I think that's, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm warm if you pitch me, like on, on your idea, I'm not gonna like take you up. But if you see me in a deep convo, just as an example, if you see anybody like an investor in a deep conversation with somebody, like almost just kind of like, just do what leopards and cheetahs and lions do, right? Like you just gotta, you gotta wait in the grass for a little bit until you get the opportunity to strike at that gazelle. Not um, a stalker. And yeah, <laughs> well, you, gotta, you gotta get that check, you know, so. Maybe look you, away. Yeah, every I found. Few seconds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like get, get wrapped up in another. But get your peripherals right. You know, make sure you just keep them in a the line of sight. Because that there's no worse feeling than being interrupted in like a real rich conversation, and then a mediocre pitch, and then it's like, golly, can't believe they did that. All right, and then we'll wrap up with Michael. Um, what advice would you give to parents or families in, in Tulsa or anywhere who are you know, wanting their children or wanting to encourage their children to explore technology but may not have the knowledge, the resources, or just the proper exposure to those opportunities? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the long and short of it. Come to um, Urban Coders Guild. We actually teach young folks about computer science. They learn how to build their own websites. They learn how to uh, create their own online games. They learn how to create their own mobile apps. They're always on their phones playing some game or something. So it's an opportunity for them to go from being a um, creator to being a producer um, of their own platforms. Super important because so many of our young folks do the same thing. I'm not, a, I'm not gonna knock sports. Sports are great. Um, I'm not gonna knock the arts because the arts are great but it's also important to try something new, try something different, especially knowing that, yeah, they're learning how to code, but they're also learning communication skills, they're learning how to collaborate with others, and they're building their critical thinking skills for the 21st century, and it's just as important as all the other skills that they're gonna learn as young folks. Awesome, uh, well, thank you all um, for answering those questions. You guys kind of like read my mind with some of this stuff, if it'll, Switch, I was gonna try to promote some of your events, um, but you Come talked on, about man. all That's of all them right. already. Um, you got a career in this. <laughs> so, um, 
Over the weekend, um, they mentioned it at the start, but Michael and Urban Coders Guild ho hosting um, the Black Futures Hackathon. Um, this QR code, I'll, I'll leave this up afterwards. I wasn't thinking about the speaker's heads being over the QR codes when I made this. Um, this is for the sign-up sheet for the event, um, but I believe on Michael's LinkedIn um, and on the o Urban Coders Guild social media, you'll be able to find the link to volunteer for that if you'd like to. Um, moving on to First Friday, you gave like the perfect elevator pitch for First Friday. That was awesome. Um, next First Friday is coming up March 1st, so in a few weeks, so definitely something to, you know, just see attend to. I guess it's going to be at Fulton Street now, isn't Fulton it? Street, yeah, yeah, so great ch chance to check out that space and, you know, interact with some people there. Um, and then Act House, if you have not seen it on social media or LinkedIn so far, pushing um, cohort six applications right now, um, so that's something you're interested in. Um, definitely a good time to reach out and get started. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony. I guess like you were about to. I'll leave it open to anyone else if you guys have any final comments um, or you know things you'd like to leave anything with. No, I'm good. I'm Gucci. Awesome. Thank you all. <laughs>